A few weeks ago, we bestowed a deserved but admittedly slightly sweary nickname um, on an American diplomat, on Robert Ford, the American ambassador to Syria. We decided that he should not be called ambassador, but rather ambassador. The Syrian government, President Bashar al-Assad's regime, had been trying to keep Robert Ford from leaving Syria's capital. They did not want him visiting and thereby bucking up anti-government protesters in Syria's cities. Syria's cities like Hama, where tens of thousands of people have been protesting Assad's government for months. As we reported, Ambassador Ford went to Hama anyway. Protesters greeted him by throwing flowers on his car and extending to him actual physical olive branches. Suffice to say, the Assad government was none too thrilled with the ambassador. Government loyalists attacked the U.S. embassy in Syria. They also attacked Ambassador Ford's house, to which the ambassador responded by going out and showing his support for protesters again, hence the nickname. Uh, but today, our government decided that credible threats to Robert Ford's safety in Syria decided that, badass or not, he should now come home. So, Ambassador Ford is coming home. Ambassador Ford has been asked to come home for consultations. He has not been withdrawn. He has not been recalled. He's been asked to come home for consultations. I want to take this opportunity to call on the government of Syria to immediately end its smear campaign of malicious and deceitful propaganda against Ambassador Ford. Following that news today, that our ambassador is coming home from Syria. Now, Syria has responded by calling their ambassador home from here. Joining us exclusively tonight for the interview is someone for whom a circumstance like that is not unusually complicated or fraught. It's just Monday. Our nation's <laughs> ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice. Madam Ambassador, thank you for being here. Good to be back. Um, the Syrian situation um, is one of many complicated situations right now in the U.S., but because I started with it, let me just ask you if this is a, this is a serious thing. Does this constitute a real escalation in tensions between our two countries? No, Rachel. I think the, the reality is that Ambassador Ford is coming back uh, to have the opportunity to consult with colleagues and officials in Washington. Uh, we obviously take quite seriously the threat information that we've had, uh, and we want to ensure that uh, he has the, all of the protection that he needs and deserves when he returns, and that the Syrian authorities assume their responsibilities to first stop inciting violence against him, uh, stop uh, inciting attacks on our embassy and our personnel, uh, and ensure, as they are obliged to do under international law, that he and every other diplomat have the protections that they uh, are uh, deserving of. When we look at what the changes that have happened in the Middle East um, in recent months, in just the past year, I mean, in, in Syria, our government's position is that the Assad regime should go. In Libya, our position was that we would intervene militarily to protect civilians there, but it was not a military aim of that intervention to replace Gaddafi. The people of Libya did that themselves, but with significant military help from us. We've also got a complicated relationship with Bahrain. We've got a complicated relationship with Iran. Uh, in Egypt, obviously, our support for Hosni Mubarak has, has, has transferred to support for the people who overthrew Hosni Mubarak. Is there a principled way that we should understand on what basis the United States will get involved in conflicts abroad? How does our government now decide that? Well, first of all, Rachel, each of these situations is obviously different, not just within the Middle East in the context of the Arab Spring, but around the world where this, this same question pertains. Uh, we have been very consistent in adhering to some bottom line core principles. We will stand up for people who seek to assert their basic human rights to assemble freely, speak freely, form their future governments. Uh, and we have done that throughout uh, the Arab Spring, throughout North Africa and the Middle East, as we frankly do around the world. Now, how we do that in different contexts, obviously, has varied uh, according to what we think will be most effective and desirable in that particular context. So in some places like uh, Iran and Libya, uh, we've employed tough sanctions. In some places, we have used real strong diplomatic efforts to, to try to affect the situation. Yemen is an example of that. Uh, in other places, we've been very forthright in saying that leaders have to go, as we have in Syria, as we ultimately did in, in Egypt. Um, in the case of Libya, which was quite unique, um, we ultimately led an international uh, coalition uh, approved by the United Nations to protect civilians. But that was, as you pointed out, not uh, a coalition that's aim was regime change. Why did we do that in Libya? What made Libya 
uh, particular? Well, in the first instance, we had Gaddafi who after 42 years had demonstrated on numerous occasions his readiness to slaughter tens of thousands of his own people in one day. We had him on the doorstep of Benghazi, threatening to go house to house and kill his people like rats, language which is reminiscent of genocides we have heard in other contexts. Uh, We knew that he had the ability, uh, was ready and, and on the doorstep to do it and had a history of doing it. At the same time, We had the Arab League, as the countries of the region, as well as the people of Libya, literally begging the international community to intervene. We were able to get clear-cut international authorization through the United Nations Security Council for collective action to protect civilians. And we were able to mobilize a coalition to accomplish that that included not only uh, NATO countries, but Arab countries, and to do so on short notice. All of those things came together. And President Obama made the judgment that it was in our national security interests, as well as uh, consistent with our principles and values, given that we had the ability, we had the support, and it was dead urgent that we do so to intervene. And that was an enormous success. We not only protected the people of Benghazi and throughout the East, but uh, with uh, uh, the support of of NATO and and Arab partners, uh, we were able ultimately to see civilians now throughout Libya protected and, uh, as you point out, a non-military aim, the removal of of Gaddafi achieved. I think a lot about um, how much the United States uses military force. We are obviously um, the inheritors and the builders um, and the custodians of the greatest military force the world has ever known. Um, At great expense, um, but something about which we have great pride and also comes with a great responsibility. Is there no bright line about deciding whether or not to use military force? Is there nothing that's different about military force as compared to all of the other options that the United States has? Uh, Tough language, uh, diplomatic confrontation, sanctions, and all these other things. Is there one thing that makes it possible for the U.S. to use military force that isn't true about the other kinds of things that we use? Well, certainly the decision to employ the the military forces uh, of our country and send men and women into armed conflict is the most solemn decision that any president has to take. I think President Obama has been very clear that he is exercising that judgment very judiciously and wisely and has only employed uh, the use of force uh, on one occasion um, that under his presidency, other than conflicts that, that he inherited. Um, but Wait, Rachel, that, that's, I mean, that's not, tr- that's not true. I mean, we've, we've just sent 100 combat-armed trainers into Uganda no. with the notice that they would fire no. back if fired no, upon. No, Rachel, they are 100 yeah. uh, advisors and trainers. And we have, of course, armed for self-defense, and their rules of engagement are purely for self-defense. They will not be engaged in combat. That's been explicit from the outset and explicit in their rules of engagement. Why have we sent 100 uh, trainers and advisors to uh, Central Africa, particularly Uganda, to help finalize the uh, defeat of the Lord's Resistance Army, one of the most brutal, uh, heinous, terrorist organizations on the planet that has been going around for 15, 20 years and literally kidnapping children, killing their parents, raping their brothers and sisters, and impressing them into conflict. I've been up to northern Uganda, to to Gulu, during the height of the conflict. I held a one-month-old child who was left for dead on the side of the road where her family was slaughtered and her brothers taken off to fight. That is one of the most brutal, horrific conflicts on the planet. And through the concerted efforts of uh, countries in the region, particularly Uganda with American support over many years, they have shrunk enormously the size of the Lord's Resistance Army. There is a remnant of a few hundred that are still marauding around the Central African region, including in South Sudan, Congo, Central African Republic, parts of Uganda. The president took the decision on the basis of a bipartisan piece of legislation coming out of Congress that if we could help through advice and assistance, not putting Americans into combat to help the countries of the region end this threat once and for all, then that was a worthwhile investment. So we need to make the distinction between where we send advisors and trainers, which we have in many different parts of the world who are not engaged in combat, as is the case here, from actual combat. And in the case of um, 
of Libya, uh, let us also recall that not a single American soldier was deployed on the ground, not a single boot on the ground. All that we accomplished, and it was a great deal, was accomplished in the first instance by diplomacy, and second instance by a coalition of NATO and Arab partners that employed air power, uh, and we contributed enormously to that in the, in the early days and subsequently with intelligence and uh, logistical support throughout and accomplished a mission that some said couldn't be accomplished without boots on the ground. So there's more than one way to employ uh, the U.S. military to achieve our objectives, not all of which necessitate putting U.S. forces into combat. In, in terms of how we, even if you don't think about the way other countries perceive us, but in terms of we as citizens perceive the way that we are using force around the world, um, this is something about which I know you will not say anything, but I have to ask you anyway. We use the CIA as essentially a military force in our country now. CIA drone strikes um, are essentially disavowed by our government, but are a means by which we use force. Um, when can Americans as a citizenry expect to ever have accountability for that? If our own political elected officials will not explain to us what we are doing, what they are doing in our name because it's the CIA, how can we ever have a say over whether we ought to be doing that or not? How, how is that not just autonomous the action? The American people had a say when, they, uh, when Congress passed the authorization to use force following 9-11 to go after al-Qaeda, and that's what we're doing. Does that ever expire? It, it, there isn't a deadline in that law, but it, hopefully it will expire as we continue to weaken and attrite al-Qaeda. And we've made enormous progress over the course of the last uh, several years, but particularly the past year, where we have seen the... the uh, we've seen Osama bin Laden and many of his most senior deputies taken off the battlefield, Alaki off the battlefield, uh, and, and people in places that, uh, uh, that we don't often discuss, including some very important uh, cases in Somalia. So, look, al-Qaeda is a global force. Its aims have not changed. It's morphed somewhat uh, since 9-11, but it remains dangerous. And President Obama is committed to protecting the American people uh, in the ways that are necessary. Uh, and he has done it with remarkable success. Uh, he's done it with uh, uh, limited uh, engagement of U.S. forces outside of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that's something that the American people respect uh, and appreciate, given that it, it, we are safer when we have fewer adversaries sworn to kill us with the means to do it. Our nation's ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Susan Rice, I, um, you have an impossibly complicated job, and I appreciate your willingness to, to talk with me about it, even when I ask you stuff that <laughs> I'm sure isn't the most com comfortable conversation making. Thank you for I being here. I always enjoy being on your show. Thanks Thank very you very much. much. We'll be right back.